Kalu. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this session. Um, we're hearing about GPL enforcement and the customer benefits um, from Julian Kim. So can you um, give him a very um, warm welcome to the group panel? We'll have uh, five minutes for questions at the end, but um, great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming here. I, I've been a volunteer for a couple of years, but it's nice to you know, have my own session and present to you like, stuff I, I've been working about. Uh, and thank you for coming here. And I'm going to talk to you today about GPL enforcement and customer benefits evidence from OpenWRT. Uh, just a bit about myself. I'm a doctoral student. I'm studying the economics of innovation, and I'm particularly focused on kind of the software industries and innovation within the software context. I am not a programmer by training, so if I get any, uh, any of the details wrong or you know, if I'm mistaken on any of the details, please feel free to let me know, and I'm very happy to learn more about this. Um, but what I am going to focus on and what, what I've been trained on is kind of observationally uh, taking the data, measurement, and analyzing the data in order to make sense of uh, this data. So I'll continue to... Uh, to motivate, we all know that GPL enforcement is important. And two or so years ago at Libra Planet, uh, Bradley Kuhn had a talk about uh, GPL enforcement as well. And there he talked about the three kind of um, stages, the principles, strategies, and tactics of kind of free software, and in that order of importance. So principles are the most important part. Um, they're the four freedoms. The freedom to run the program as you wish, the freedom to study and edit how the program works, the freedom to redistribute copies and the freedom to distribute your modified copies. And these are four principles that we all as free software advocates can agree on and uh, hope to support. And in order to you know, up uphold these principles, one of the strategies that we use is GPL enforcement and copyleft. And uh, copyleft is a strategy to get these four freedoms, and it's not a principle unto itself. GPL itself might have some value or not, but our, our measurement of the value of the GPL is whether it enforces these four freedoms or not. And then there's a lot of um, controversy on the specific tactics that are used to enforce the GPL and whether they are effective in doing these. Um, so in particular, the the main central issue that I'm going to, that I've been noticing is that there's a big debate on whether GPL should take legal action to enforce the GPL or not. And there's a, the proponents of this are saying that legal action is necessary, but it's, it is a last resort. And this is part of the uh, SF's um, principles of community oriented GPL enforcement that legal action is a last resort. And RMS also has, um, has said that the GPL is not Mr. Nice Guy, and when a redistributor obdurately persists in violating the GPL, a lawsuit may be the only way to go. However, there's also the opposite side saying that you know, legal action is unnecessary, and that um, you know, this is a lot of these, the so-called kind of open source proponents will take this kind of stance. And to illustrate this example, um, this is, I've just copied this off of one of the articles that I was reading on ZDNet, it's from a while back. Um, and it cites Bradley Kuhn, who was the, who was the president of the SFC, and it, he was talking about Linux, and in, in, the, in the red line there, he says that we have two options. We can all decide to give up on the GPL, or we can enforce it in courts, and it sounds pretty reasonable as to uh, where he's coming from. But then to this, um, Greg Crow Hartman uh, had uh, prepared a reply, and then saying that, you know, he says he also never opposes GPL enforcement, but that he does oppose the specific way that the Free Software Foundation and Bradley um, have approached this task. And you know, it's it's good to. I'll just read out kind of his response and um, and from below the red line. And he says, and here's why: I too have had people say to my face numerous times, "You think that we have to follow the GPL? Okay, then take us to court. We won't comply otherwise." And guess what? No one took anyone to court, and every single time I ended up with the code. As you well know, when you take legal action against someone, you have to be prepared to lose and accept the consequences of that loss. Frankly, I'm not prepared to lose, and there's no way in hell that I'm willing to accept the consequences of such a loss. So you can see kind of where you know, the both, both sides are coming from in this debate. And this got me thinking, like, why are there such divergent opinions as to, you know, we all agree upon the four, uh, the four freedoms, and that GPL is a strategy to enforce those four freedoms, but I was, you know, kind of 
my question was, how, why are there such divergent opinions as to how GPL is enforced? And in my opinion, I think this is because they have different variables of interest. And as we, you know, where we're coming from is we want to uphold the four freedoms, and therefore we're mostly interested in protecting the user's freedom. And if lawsuits are a way to get at this, then it is a completely viable way to uphold, it's a viable strategy to enforce um, software freedom. Um, but from the other side, and from Greg Crow Hartman and Linus Torvalds and other people, they seem to be more interested in getting more code out of enforcement of GPL and getting more developers, expanding the code base, just growing as a whole, it seems like. And this is kind of where I'm coming from. And this is to, to kind of show you an example of this. This is uh, Linus's uh, response to kind of the whole thread of Bradley Kuhn and um, Greg Crow Hartman. And he says, let us not kid ourselves. That may be the shining moment for SFC, but it was not a shining moment for BusyBox. All it resulted in was a huge amount of bickering and in both individual and commercial developers and users fleeing in droves. So you can see that they're kind of focused on attracting developers, attracting users, and attracting um, uh, commercial you know, interests forth. Um, and kind of to you know, drive on that point a bit further, this is from the BusyBox enforcement, and this is, um, uh, this is Rob Landley, who is, I think, one of the, the, um, the principal people within the BusyBox enforcement. And he said that you know, regarding the BusyBox software, uh, you know, the litigations regarding BusyBox, he thinks that they never found anything, use, found any actual useful code that could have gone upstream. And he kind of, you know, says again on his, um, in his blog post that he spent over a year doing uh, BusyBox license enforcement and a dozen lawsuits later, I'm still unaware of a single line of code added to the BusyBox repository as a result of this. So just to reiterate, I'm just highlighting the differences of where people are coming from. Is, is it, do they want to protect the freedoms or do they want to, you know, get more source code, get more, track more developers and so forth? And so in this talk, I'm going to have these two broad research questions. So has GPL enforcement have ever led to upstreamable code as the, as the other side has always argued? And you know, more to our kind of point of view, how did GPL enforcement or how did GPL enforcement help users to get their freedom? So just to caveat, I'm not going to talk uh, and not going to give a definite answer as to whether GPL should or should not involve lawsuits. I'm agnostic as to exactly you know, what the appropriate methodology would be. Um, I'm not going to answer where GPL, whether GPL enforcement via lawsuits leads to more code upstream or more users' freedom. Uh, but I will go into depth about the Cisco GPL Linksys um, enforcement as far as I understand it. I was not a participant of this, but coming from the outside, I was looking at the um, uh, internet archives and so forth. And I will show that it led to a significant amount of you know, follow on source code. And I will look at how, this, um, how the source code obtained through the GPL affected users. And I'm going to be able to show that it actually seems to benefit users um, and the users actually value having more control over their wireless routers. Um, and hopefully after this talk, you'll get a sense that it's important to look at all of the discussions surrounding free software and be able to measure the independent variables and then try to use those to support our cause and maybe that will lead other people to agree upon the broader goals of software freedom and voluntarily uh, help the free software cause. So just to give a brief outline of the talk, I'm just going to go through these. But I will walk you through kind of what, uh, you know, like an economist or a management kind of person would think about when they're looking at uh, innovation within the software realm. So regarding kind of GPL and software, uh, uh, development, there's two strands of literature that are related. The first is IP protection, intellectual property protection and innovation, and the relationship between protecting and innovating. Uh, and then the second literature, which I'll briefly touch on, is uh, the enforcement of intellectual property and how this leads or affects settlement behaviors. 
Um, and you know, I'm going to talk broadly about IP, but there's a lot of different types of innovation, uh, intellectual property protections, there's copyright, patents, trademarks, but most of the academic literature has focused on patenting, uh, but it should apply to uh, a lot of these different categories as well. Um, but one of the foundational points within the innovation literature as to um, why intellectual property should be protected is called the paradox of disclosure, and it goes back to Ken Arrow's article in 1962. And so the situation is kind of like this. You have an inventor that has a great idea. You have several sellers that are, you know, hopefully they have the means to monetize off of this idea. And the inventor is looking to sell his idea, or his or her idea, to the, the, sell, to the buyers. Um, but in order for the buyers to kind of know how valuable this idea is, they must first understand the idea and then be able to value it on their terms. But this kind of is a paradox because once you have communicated the ideas in order, to, in order for the buyers to evaluate it, you've already communicated and the transaction's complete, and therefore they can just take the idea and then they can um, use it for themselves. And, you know, it was summarized very well saying that it's difficult for a potential buyer to assess the value of an idea before disclosure, but once the idea is known, the buyer has little incentive to pay. And this is one of the kind of main reasons that, you know, patent law is all, you know, they're about protecting the individual inventors and giving them monopoly rights over their inventions in order so that they have incentives to innovate and so because, and they have incentives to come up with new ideas that they can sell later to potential buyers. However, and you know, there's some empirical work that shows um, you know, patent protection is valuable at some points in time. First of all, they enable startup growth. It's, um, so whoever, within startups, whoever is able to get a patent, uh, they, you know, they go through massive growth, growths in kind of funding they get, the, uh, the employment opportunities they, they get as well. And there's also a correlation between uh, a patent grant and its scientific importance, suggesting that you know it's the system works that more valuable ideas um, get patented and then they uh, they are funded better and so forth. However, there's a really significantly larger literature that's suggesting that you know the patent system and intellectual property protection isn't working as you know we intended to we had intended it to. Um, the first example of which are, you know, the abuse of these patent rights. There's patent trolls. Um, there's uh, patent thickets. So patent trolls are people who will take patents and then they'll sue the trivial patents and then they'll try to sue other companies into, uh, you know, getting some money from them. Patent thickets are when you have too many patents that are covering similar technologies that it's kind of, there's a lot of enforcement um, externalities that are built in here. It's also very widely documented that patenting discourages follow-on innovation. And you know, the papers that I've cited here are looking at the Human Genome Project, um, and you know, some, of, some parts of the human genome were initially patented, and those parts led to less scientific papers. Uh, similar uh, events happened in mouse uh, in mice and developing uh, patents with mice. Uh, and there's broader evidence, not just in those scientific disciplines, but across the entire patenting um, communities. And uh, the other argument, which is kind of a more fundamental uh, take, is that you know, there's different types of intellectual property protection, and they call for different types of protection. Uh, so uh, RMS has a paper in the Loyola uh, Law Journal about this as well, and he says that, you know, in particular, software um, you know, patenting might make sense if there are very few ideas that can be patented and therefore, you know, you want to protect whatever few ideas there are. But in, in terms of software, there's, you know, a lot of ideas. There's various, there's very many different ways that you can achieve at the, uh, you can arrive at those ideas. And therefore, protecting one way of arriving at an idea is not going to be sufficient to protect all of these. And similar cases are uh, mentioned in the uh, movie industry where they're selling scripts for all of these. Um, and just briefly on kind of copyright enforcement and the outcomes, uh, fundamentally there's a chilling effect of kind of using copyright enforcement, using legal means to, um, to enforce copyright. 
uh, and they, there's a chilling effect that it may deter existing or future customers away. And in a case of free software, if some party litigates too frequently on, to, on the basis of their copyrights, it might deter other developers or other users from using that source code, and therefore it might not be good in terms of protecting the freedom for the users as well. Um, and just in terms of like the nitty gritty, there's documentation that litigation success rates can be improved by increasing the monetary threats. But also there's the whole psychological argument of, you know, just, the, just communicating more clearly about what, you know, what, what is involved in coming up with the copyrighted ideas seems to lead to a lot of, um, uh, a lot of successful enforcement as well. So this is how kind of like the general economics or the business kind of audience might think about uh, GPL enforcement and software in, uh, innovation within the whole uh, free software sphere. Um, but as I said, I'm not going to give a definite answer as to any of these questions, but I'll take you into depth about the Cisco and Linksys GPL violation. And I've constructed a timeline as far as I understand it. So this is in 2001, November, uh, Linksys released their WRT54G. Um, this is what it looks like. But when they were releasing it, they had, I think, um, the original equipment manufacturer was Cybertan. So they had contracted with Cybertan to create and possibly uh, you know, build one of, a router to Linksys specifications. And Cybertan uh, sourced their chipsets, the system, uh, the system on chip from Broadcom. And somewhere along the way, one of these parties included a Linux distribution within the WRT54G, uh, but they failed to mention it in any of their documentations, and they just shipped it out, shipped out the Linux and the GNU, uh, GNU Linux system on the router uh, to their customers. And to further complicate the issue, uh, instead of Linksys being a standalone company, by March 2003, uh, Cisco, a much larger corporation, had acquired Linksys at the time. And so in June, there was a, um, come June, there started a large amount of social activity on, you know, this uh, router that we have contains GNU Linux code, and therefore Andrew Miklos sent one of the first emails, I think, to the Linux cur uh, kernel mailing list, uh, pointing out that this, this hardware contains the GNU Linux code. And he had been pestering Linksys and Cisco, uh, and I think other people had been doing the same thing, and Linksys apparently released some source code in July of 2003, so it's not too bad. It was only like a month or so that it took. But the only problem is that it didn't compile on the system. So again, in September, Andrew Miklos sent another email to the Linux kernel mailing list saying that, you know, although they did release some components of their operating system, the GNU Linux system that they had installed within the, uh, link, uh, the WRT54G, it doesn't compile and therefore it's, it's not up to the standards of the GPL. Uh, and around this time, the, the kind of, the, the collective outcry for source code from Linksys and Cisco became large enough that the FSF step, stepped in uh, and then they started collecting all of the opinions for um, regarding the, the WRT54G. And I think this is one of the uh, first um, uh, events that uh, Bradley Kuhn had been uh, involved in as well. So, but, so this move on the whole was pretty successful in October 2003. Linksys released more source code. This time it compiles. Uh, the, the only thing that was kind of left out, I think, was the binary drivers. So they didn't include the source code for the, the wireless drivers itself. Um, I mean, they, I think, they, as far as I can understand, they, they included a binary format, but not the source code. So it would link to everything, and then it would run, but then it's not, you, want, you don't have entire control over the computers, uh, over the system. And that code directly led to the founding of OpenWRT in, in January of 2004. And is, you know, it's been 15 years. There's now uh, across all of the, the kind of repositories that OpenWRT has, they have over 60,000 commits. Um, 
tons of contributors, over 500. I don't know, I don't know the unique count of contributors, but it's a massive amount of code that's generated by just because uh, you know, Cisco and Linksys were forced to release their source code to the public. So in order to look at whether this, um, how this impacted customers and other people, I, you know, I did what I was kind of trained to do. I started collecting data. Um, I went to wikidevi.com to look at all of the uh, wireless routers that you know, were released from 1999 to 2017. Uh, I matched this with the OpenWRT, the list of hardware. So the OpenWRT lists all, uh, lists all of the wireless routers that their program is compatible with. And so um, I was able to match these. So for each router, I have kind of the hardware characteristics from uh, Wikidevi. And then I have whether and when they became compatible with OpenWRT. And finally, I match this to the uh, review data on Amazon.com. So Amazon has a list of, you know, for each product, you have the whole history of reviews starting from when it got released, you know, who left what kind of reviews, the review ratings, and so forth. So this is kind of what the, uh, what the data collection process looked like. I, from the matched sample of wikidevi.com, and the, I'm not just using OpenWRT, I was using lead and DDWRT as well. But I get the hardware characteristics, whether they're compatible with these custom firmware projects, um, you know, the dates that they became compatible. And then I collect the review ratings for each of these products as well as the review text for these products. Uh, and so the final data set covers around 1,106 products. So this is kind of the intersection of Amazon.com and Wikidevi. Uh, there's 184,000 reviews by 151,000 uh, reviewers. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to use some statistical methods that will allow me to get at some sort of causality between whether it's actually OpenWRT that's causing this, um, causing certain changes in the review ratings or the number of reviews and so forth. So. To give you a quick summary of my findings, I, I, this, you know, this is part of my dissertation. It'll be in a much more completed form later on. Uh, but, you know, broadly speaking, OpenWRT compatible routers have higher review ratings than non-compatible routers. They sell more, so there's two different measures. I, they have more reviews to begin with, but Amazon also records the sales rank within each category of these routers. And you know, they, lo and behold, they, ha they sell, you know, they have lower sales rank, which means that they're higher up on the list of uh, products with sales. They also last longer on the market. I don't know if this is you know, particularly good for the companies themselves or bad, but they do last longer. And the same goes to the chipsets that are compatible with OpenWRT. But, you know, you can say that there's obvious reasons that there's like, you know, like if you compare the OpenWRT compatible routers with the non-compatible routers, maybe there's a reason that some routers became compatible with OpenWRT and some routers did not. And maybe it's like the community wants to support routers that are already, you know, very popular and therefore that I'm capturing some of that. But I can keep the routers constants and I can look at before and after the, the product becomes compatible with OpenWRT, and I still see that they increase review ratings as well as um, the sales, you know, the rankings, and the number of reviews, and so forth. Um, but, you know, even with all of that, the, these results could come from a lot of different reasons. So maybe there's, like, different, you know, different paths that, you know, uh, there's hardware characteristics that determine both the number of reviews that a product gets and whether it's compatible with OpenWRT. Um, one of the main kind of issues that I was struggling with is that, you know, companies can anticipate support for OpenWRT. So they'll be like, oh, you know, maybe, you know, there's this OpenWRT thing. Maybe I'll just use this to our advantage and maybe I will be able to create a product that is easier for people to develop on, and therefore it might get, you know, I'll price it a bit cheaper than other things so that it'll get more reviews, higher sales, and still get OpenWRT support. Um, 
And this is one of the, this is where I uh, used a, what we call a natural experiment to kind of establish the causality. Um, what a natural experiment does is kind of, it, it removes this anticipation factor as much as I can control for it. So the companies did not have any uh, anticipatory you know, expectations about whether a router becomes compatible with OpenWRT or not, but they just developed the, soft, developed the hardware and then it, it became compatible through uh, various means. And the way that I um, got at this was through, the, uh, through documenting the reverse engineered wireless drivers within the Linux kernel. So, uh, you know, Wikipedia generously pr provides a list of reverse engineered device drivers um, and the, I think one of the, so somewhere it links all of the hard, the chipset, you know, serial numbers to whether they correspond to a certain um, driver or not. And therefore I can get for each router, whether or not the underlying software for the device drivers was reverse engineered or not. And this reverse engineering, as far as I understand, um, companies, you know, when they were releasing the, when they were designing the WRT54G, they weren't like, you know, Broadcom's gonna get reverse engineered and therefore we're going to, you know, make this incompatible or compatible with OpenWRT. Um, and so, uh, so this is a way that I am going to try to capture this. And uh, so this is the, a statistical model that uses a um, difference in differences framework. So it'll compare the router products that were reverse engineered with those that were never compatible with OpenWRT. So I'll be capturing just the effect that reverse engineering had on the review ratings of these products. Uh, and you know, there, you might say that there's time specific reasons that you know, the ratings might differ and I'm controlling for those. There might be reasons that are uh, you know, different for different types of routers and I'll be controlling for those as well. Um, just to give you a summary of what the results look like, this on the y-axis you have the difference in ratings between the reverse engineered and thus compatible routers with the never compatible routers. So on the leftmost dot it says that there's not too much of a difference between the reverse engineered routers and the, the never compatible routers, but as soon as you get to a point where the reverse engineering happens and then you are, the, the product becomes compatible with OpenWRT, you see an increase in the review ratings for the devices that became compatible relative to the devices that were never compatible. And this is kind of a way to show that, you know, a lot of the rev increase in review ratings isn't just driven by, you know, what corporates, you know, corporate anticipatory activities or, you know, developers' decisions to develop on OpenWRT. Uh, for a particular product, but it seems that it's this realization of the possibility of installing your own system. And to, to, just to give you the magnitude of this, it seems like it's around a 0.5 star increase in review ratings, which is around 20% of the baseline, considering that you know, most products have like a 3.6, 3.8-ish uh, review rating. And so this is, you know, most of the stuff that I had um, kind of uh, prepared for, but so to briefly conclude, I wanted to leave you a message that GPL enforcement can lead to downstream code, especially in the case of, you know, OpenWRT. It did lead to a significant amount of contributors and a significant amount of contributions to the OpenWRT source code. Um, it also played a significant role in enhancing the customer's benefits in the wireless router market. So the customers actually value the ability to install new types of firmware. You know, it sounds pretty obvious to us, but then to like a broader audience, maybe it's not as obvious because when I was first coming in, I didn't have OpenWRT running on my router, but, um, but now, you know, I see the value in it. And I think there's a lot of people that do not know the value of this. Um, and uh, in particular, I'm sh I've, you know, I've established that compatibility with OpenWRT increases user satisfaction as well as kind of the overall product market performance. And hopefully I can, you know, this can be a message to other corporations as well. And maybe if they take a more friendly stance to free software and allow for their users freedom, 
then maybe this might help them as well in terms of their product market performance. Um, but to leave you with just two kind of final thoughts, I think there's a lot of potential for quantitative analysis within the, um, within the free software sphere. So for instance, we, there's a lot of verbal debate about um, the different types of licenses and whether they can attract, uh, attract or you know, which, which kinds of um, licenses protect users' freedom more than others. Uh, but I think starting out with measuring and quantitatively anal analyzing these issues, we can uh, you know, provide evidence that it's helpful for many people to um, support software freedom, uh, help users, and help the upstream and downstream development processes as well. Um, and you know, these are some brief thoughts about what I thought were opportunities, and I'm happy to, you know, please feel free to suggest more to me. But um, so a measure of freedom or like freeness of the software code base. I don't know how people would go about documenting this, but are there, you know, we, we want to uphold the four principles of software freedom, but we don't really have a measure exactly for um, how free a software code is uh, other than the license uh, that it has. Um, there's also, you know, we can think about relationships between, you know, whether more freedom leads to more innovation or uh, whether we can get more corporations to support users' freedom through these mechanisms. Uh, and there's, I, I bet there's a lot of other natural experiments in which users' freedom was suddenly increased or decreased via some sort of lawsuits or uh, other technical uh, issues that occur. And I think it's, you know, a very good starting point would be to document how such changes impact the community, how it affects developers, how it affects users, and so forth. Um, so if, so that's the, uh, that's the conclusion for my talk. It, there's some references here. Um, and that's, you know, I've, I really believe in the quantitative measurement of these things to uh, enhance software freedom. But thank you so much for. Thank you very much for that comprehensive talk. Uh, if there's any questions, please come down to the microphone. Um, we have at least one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for your talk. It was a really interesting take on that, and I think there's a lot of uh, it, there's a lot of room to see more quantitative analysis. And I was wondering if, in the course of choosing a OpenWRT, if there were other places where you thought, like, "Ooh, once I finish this, where where can we apply this next?" Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it's it's great that we have data on the router, but I know there's a lot of other places that right. we could take that. So yeah. I was curious what you thought about that. Right. Um, so the reason that I chose routers was just because, you know, there's a very concrete link to the customer side. So there's mm -hmm. sales data, there's like Amazon reviews, you, you get to see what the, uh, what the reviewers say and so forth. Uh, but in terms of other places, I'm open for suggestions as well, but um, initially I was kind of looking at just the Linux kernel itself. Mm -hmm. That also leads to a lot of products that, in, the other interesting thing about there is that they have tons of corporate participation. And I think, you know, whether that crowds out certain developers, you know, to go to other uh, operating systems or not, I think that's one way forward. Uh, I think I have another chapter just looking at the Linux kernel and just documenting the contribution patterns, whether, you know, oh. some modules were started by corporations or started by individual developers, and whether that leads to different levels of contributions from different types of people. Uh, and so hopefully that'll be interesting to, in, in future talks, I'll be able to talk about this. Um, but so, yeah. Yeah, there, that's great. Yeah, um, I, I'm open. The other big, big thing is I think Software Heritage Foundation mm -hmm. has a lot of um, opportunities for this. And just mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, are there global kind of patterns in terms of whether who contributes to these projects or uh, whether they lead to more or less development. and 
you know, how much of these licenses are GPL type licenses that are copy lefted or not. Yeah. I think that might be interesting as well. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Uh, so the question was, are, is, is intellectual property a term that we're using now? Um, could you clarify that a bit more? Or just in this talk, do you mean? Oh, All right. Marsha Wilbur, and I did my internship at the FSF in like 2002, mm -hmm. and we didn't really use the term intele intellectual property. And so when I saw your slides, which this was a great presentation, I was just curious myself if that was what we're doing now. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, as the, I, you know, I can't speak on behalf of the Free Software Foundation. Right. Uh, I'm just using, so the reason it was intellectual property protection right, 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 was, right. you know, this, like the, the literature that I cite uses this terminology. Okay. Um, but, you know, we all know that <laughs> there's uh, intellectual property protection is not all good. Right. And uh, right. no, I was just curious. That was just, you know, I right. was just a little surprised. I think it's, it's, I think it's different. So there's, there's freedom on the one hand and there's like intellectual property and then they're not mutually exclusive and they're not, they don't necessarily help each other out either. Um, so since I have the mic. Yeah. Um, do you know, are you familiar with the VMware case? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> I've heard of it and I was looking at it as well. Yeah. But so it's still ongoing, right? Or, right. I believe yeah. so. It's been going on for years, right? right? So, you know, it's, it's a very interesting topic, copyright enforcement and GPL, GPL enforcement and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Thank you yeah. so much for speaking on the topic. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, I'd like to um, thank our speaker and uh, another round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.